This video presentation and its accompanying materials are copyrighted by the American Association for Respiratory Care. Any public display, sale, copy, or distribution of the video or materials may only be undertaken with the prior written consent of the AARC. As a registered participant, you are authorized to duplicate course materials for this program for each participant viewing at your facility. This presentation and accompanying materials can be used by staff within the institution, but cannot be resold, distributed, or displayed for profit. Copyright 2019. All rights reserved. The following is a presentation of the American Association for Respiratory Care. Welcome to Current Topics in Respiratory Care. Today's topic is Everyone Needs Oxygen. Dr. Jerry Krishnan is the Associate Vice Chancellor for Population Health Sciences at the University of Illinois in Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Krishnan has no relationships to disclose. It's a pleasure to be with you here today, and, and I'm really honored uh, as a pulmonologist um, to be able to speak with you all. I think many of you, uh, I think I've known several of you, and I do actually work with um, several respiratory therapists uh, on a number of projects, and it's a pleasure uh, to share with you some work we're doing around oxygen. Uh, I'm also honored uh, to be able to speak uh, uh, as part of the Thomas L. Petty Memorial Lecture a legend in our field and one that uh, I think sets the bar high uh, for all of us. Uh, the story uh, around oxygen, uh, obviously, um, uh, we'll get into the science in a few minutes here, but what I'm hoping to do today with all of you uh, is to spend some time describing a journey that I've been making as a pulmonary critical care physician and one that increasingly has become multidisciplinary and one from which I have learned across uh, a, a, number of, uh, a number of topic areas. We have built a team called the Sherlock Team, uh, and I'm hoping at the end of the session today that uh, many of you will, uh, will agree to join the Sherlock Team. You'll see here there's about uh, 30 or so organizations, about 50 individuals, includes uh, physicians, includes um, respiratory therapists, there's even some attorneys in there, uh, along with patients who are attorneys, um, um, and nurses and, and so on. What we're learning about oxygen, and I think uh, many of you who are clinicians, I think certainly understand this, that this is a complicated area in which uh, we need to work together on. And the Sherlock team is an attempt to bring individuals together to make progress around oxygen. So um, this is almost uh, a, a silly question for this audience. Um, you might, uh, some of you may wonder, why is he talking about oxygen? Uh, I suspect uh, many of you know, know the answer. Um, if you were to think about all of the things that we have identified over the last several decades that improves the lives of individuals with chronic lung disease, and in particular, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, oxygen rises to the top among the many discoveries that we have that improve the lives, the well-being, and how long people live. Uh, this goes back almost uh, 35 years and close to 40 years now with some pivotal studies that were done that established the role of long-term oxygen therapy in saving the lives of individuals with uh, COPD and severe resting room air hypoxemia. You all will remember, of course, the pivotal studies published in Lancet and the Annals of Internal Medicine. This uh, study pre presented in Lancet is from the Medical Research Council group in the United Kingdom in which they enrolled about 90 individuals with severe resting room air hypoxemia and randomized them to long-term oxygen therapy and, as some of you may remember, home visits versus usual care. And what they were able to demonstrate in a very convincing fashion with a relatively small uh, study population is that uh, long-term oxygen therapy and home visits saves lives. This study was then followed up with uh, another multi-center National Institutes of Health sponsored trial called NOT, or Nocturnal Oxygen Therapy Trial, that demonstrated convincingly that continuous long-term oxygen therapy plus home visits 
saves more lives than nocturnal use of long-term oxygen therapy and home visits in people with COPD and resting room air hypoxemia. So it's said in other words, oxygen saves lives, and if you have resting room air hypoxemia, the longer you wear it, the longer you live. Importantly, and I, and I hope um, I uh, emphasized it enough, you'll recognize that both these studies emphasize not only the use of oxygen, but home visits to support patients in order to use it correctly, tailor oxygen therapy in their homes, and provide uh, emotional and social supports in the homes. And this will become an important issue as we talk through the rest of the lecture today. You all will also remember, and maybe many of you uh, participated in uh, the oxygen consensus conferences, and these were important meetings because it wasn't en enough to just point out that oxygen saves lives, but we needed a mechanism by which we would bring together various stakeholders relevant to oxygen therapy in order to figure out how to actually get it implemented the right way. And Tom Petty and a number of other individuals worked across uh, lines, if you will, of, of silos that many of us practice in to figure out what are the policy issues that we needed to ensure were in place so that practitioners could do the right thing and that the right patients were receiving the care that they needed. And you'll, you'll uh, recognize some of the words on these conference reports, but they talk about uh, uh, supply and demand, uh, reimbursements, uh, filling out medical necessity forms, many of the things that we still struggle with uh, doing today. Unfortunately, um, after Tom uh, Petty died, uh, these oxygen consensus conferences also ceased to exist. Uh, these consensus conferences uh, occurred for a period of around 20 years, from 1986 to 2005, and the last consensus conference was the sixth consensus conference. And I encourage all of you to read the consensus conference report. You'll notice that many of the call to action that was in the report are still very relevant today. In addition to these consensus conference report documents, uh, a number of guideline uh, committees, including this one by the GOLD uh, Committee, which is the Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease, have published recommendations regarding the use of oxygen. And you'll recognize, uh, uh, essentially, that, that there is strong recommendation, what they're calling evidence A recommendations, for the long-term use of oxygen in individuals with severe resting room air hypoxemia. You'll also remember from the data that I just presented that all of that is based on about 300 individuals studied about 35 years ago. More recently, uh, some of you will know that the results of the long-term oxygen therapy trial, or LOT, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago that tested whether or not oxygen could save lives if it was given more liberally, even those, to, even those who have moderate resting room air hypoxemia or who developed moderate hypoxemia with ex exercise. And that study demonstrated convincingly, on average, that individuals who have moderate hypoxemia, either at rest or with exercise, did not live any longer than those who are prescribed um, uh, usual care. So in a sense, what these body of studies, in total about 1,000 individuals randomized over about 35 to 40 years, have told us is that if you have severe resting room air hypoxemia, the longer you wear oxygen, the better. But if you have milder forms of hypoxemia, that on average, it does not appear to benefit patients. In addition to the evidence, I think some of you will recognize that oxygen has become a, a, a big business. Um, about a million individuals in the U.S. alone are, using, are receiving oxygen therapy, and the total cost to Medicare is approximately $2 billion as well. Any time that you start to accumulate uh, medical expenditures in, in these terms, then the government starts to pay attention to how are we using oxygen therapy, are we doing the right thing, and how are we ensuring that there's not overuse, underuse, or misuse of uh, evidence-based therapies. So some of you may be wondering, or maybe all of you already know, that there's now a problem regarding the oxygen therapy industry, which involves all of us, clinicians, durable medical equipment companies, respiratory therapists, nurses, and most importantly, our patients and our caregivers. This all began in 2009, when Medicare started to look at its expenditures and its efforts to cut costs, started to roll out what's called competitive bidding processes 
in order to award contracts for uh, specific durable medical equipment companies in terms of providing oxygen. It was done as a test in 2009 to nine large metropolitan areas, and over the last 10 years or so, now covers the entire United States. Among the many things uh, that was done is uh, started to learn about how oxygen was being used across the country. And uh, I would say because of lack of adequate advocacy on our part working together, um, reimbursements have been cut enormously from about $180 a month on average to now about $75 a month per person. This has been a, an incredible disruptive force in our industry, not only for the individuals who are in the business of providing oxygen, but for all of us who are clinicians, ensuring that our patients get the appropriate equipment and the appropriate care. This has created turmoil rather than uh, uh, improved matters, so to speak. You all will know that AARC, along with a number of other organizations, have been working hard uh, as part of the US COPD coalition in order to make some additional changes to these policies. This remains a work in progress, but one that we should not take our, uh, our eyes off of. I think we still have some ways to go. So let me tell you a little bit about what the Sherlock Consortium have been doing while a number of you uh, a number of us have been working along the policy lines. And what I'm hoping to show you today is a journey that we have, been, we have undertaken saying in addition to addressing at the policy level what needs to happen, also building the evidence base so that we can inform policymakers about some of the consequences of decisions that are being made, and then a path forward. The idea is that uh, complaints alone will not move policymakers. You've got to demonstrate a path forward. And so this is what the Sherlock Consortium is hoping to do, and I'm hoping that many of you in this audience will join that journey with us. Um, we have been spending, uh, for the past year or so, uh, meeting with our colleagues, uh, the entire stakeholder uh, uh, consortium, you should say, patients, clinicians, policymakers, and so on, learning about what's gone wrong. Where did we go wrong with, uh, with oxygen? Something that Tom Petty and, and a number of you, I suspect, were part of. How did we get our eyes off the ball, and why are we having so much difficulty giving oxygen to people uh, when they need it? This is a direct quote, uh, um, and uh, some of you, I think, will, um, will, uh, will, will certainly understand it, is that there's a residual belief, this is from a durable medical equipment company uh, expert and a member of the industry saying that there's a residual belief that the DME is a safety net and this individual said, well, you know what? There's a giant hole in this safety net. Um, we are essentially trying to operate with very low margins and the inability to actually do what we're being asked to do. We went out to patients. Uh, this is actually um, um, uh, the villages in Florida. I don't know if any of you have been uh, visited the villages. It's quite a community of, of senior citizens. Um, we said we were going to talk about oxygen, and then the room filled up, standing room only, uh, if you will, of individuals saying, we need to hear about what's happening in the oxygen industry. So patients are up in arms. And what did they say? Well, here's uh, patient number two, and there's, about, uh, there's over 100 patients that came to this uh, with relatively little advertising and marketing. Nobody was paid to attend. These are patients saying, we need help. Well, what did they tell us? said, we had no idea what to expect. In some cases, a patient said, I received a concentrator for home use and a bunch of tanks. I was never taught how to actually use this equipment. I learned what I learned through uh, conferences and asking patients other questions, asking patients questions. So what we're doing now is we've devolved to a state where we're sending equipment out to people's homes and not providing the supports for our patients to learn what to do with it. Um, there's over 60 questions that were asked. Uh, these were questions that I was never trained to answer as a pulmonary critical care physician. I'm a so-called expert in, in this field, but I, I, was, I really was taken aback by the kinds of questions that were being asked and the inability to actually answer them in a meaningful, thoughtful way. So what we did do is we, we agreed to write down these questions and then through a series of discussions with a number of individuals, both in respiratory care, nursing, and so on, we actually individually answered questions and posted them uh, on a website. And again, this information is on your card. We've also sent it to Tom Kallstrom uh, at AARC, along with the COPD Foundation and others, to say, we need to create a source of truth 
that provides our patients um, legitimate fact-based information about what we know and what we don't know and provide a mechanism to support our patients. I think our path through this, if one thing you learned from me today in this talk, is that I don't think professional societies can do this alone. We're going to need to work with our colleagues, the people that we serve, our patients, to raise the volume on what, what is happening out there. So we need to figure out what is on their mind, and, and uh, we put together this document, and hopefully you all will take a look. And if you have questions or how to improve the responses, let us know. This is a working document. Well, um, so you might say patients don't know or patients don't know enough. Uh, these are doctors and nurses that I work with in Chicago, and you can see that they don't know either. So we have nurse practitioners, uh, a nurse in my clinic, we have pulmonologists, and we're trying to figure out how to actually make this piece of equipment work. Uh, and in fact, the only information that we have is the same information that patients get, and this is from our electronic health record. The only information that there's even relevant to oxygen says on page two, don't smoke, you could blow up. <laughs> um, it's probably not enough information, right? And now we wonder why our patients don't use this equi the, their oxygen, because they're being scared away from the very things that's life-saving, right? So while it's important not to smoke, we may also want to spend some time talking about how to use the equipment uh, appropriately. So one of the areas that the Sherlock Consortium has been thinking about spending its time, this is an area that, that needs a lot of attention, so you got to sort of pick an area and, and spend some time on it, is we've been thinking about the hospital-to-home transition area. Uh, and the reason for this is that the same policymakers or the same payers, CMS in particular, but also Medicaid, uh, as they're thinking about where to focus on the improvement efforts, have been looking at hospital to home as an area. And, and we wanted to understand where does oxygen sort of fit in this uh, oxygen, where does oxygen fit in the hospital to home transition journey? So I think many of you will recognize that as patients make the journey from hospital to home to the outpatient arena, the question is what's happening to those oxygen tanks, the oxygen prescriptions, the, the practices, now, many of us in this room, including myself, actually don't work in all three of those settings. So while we, we may know something about one of those settings, the hospital setting, or perhaps we do home visits, most of us don't, but perhaps work in the outpatient setting, very few of us actually do the journey the way the patients do the journey. So the question is, what's happening there? I think most of us, and it almost doesn't need evidence to prove this, but most of us would agree that if we are making effective transitions, you'll keep people in the home outpatient loop, meaning that they will be able to thrive and do well in the outpatient arena and again, stay away from hospitals. Most of us, I think, would agree, even without evidence, that ineffective transitions are the reasons why we're having readmissions. Uh, that's not to say that even if we do everything perfectly right, we can uh, avoid all readmissions, but certainly we can do better in terms of reducing the risk of avoidable readmissions. Some of the uh, data and studies that we're doing, we have about 200,000 patients worth of data looking at this, and uh, there's a paper under review right now that demonstrates that about 10% of patients who are going from hospital to home are having disruptions in their oxygen care, meaning they're not receiving their oxygen equipment or tanks. Something is happening where patients are then saying that they're left with, uh, they're left with a problem with their own oxygen, so 10%. That's a big number when you start doing the math uh, year in and year out. Importantly, that 10% of patients has double the readmissions risk. So they go from about a 20% readmissions risk to about a 40% readmission risk if there's a disruption in the oxygen care. So that's part of how we're trying to build the evidence is to point out this isn't just a nice to have, you know, helping patients through the transitions with oxygen. This is a must have. We need to figure this out. And we not only need to figure this out to help our patients, but this is going to end up costing money to individuals who are trying to cut costs. We need to be able to speak in terms that relate to the stakeholders that are participating in, in creating, I think, some of the challenges that we now face around oxygen. So one of my colleagues, uh, Jenny Scully, uh, uh, along with a number of others, spent quite a bit of time tracing the patient journey from hospital to home to the outpatient arena and it turns out there's no fewer than 10 types of individuals, maybe more, that are involved in that journey. 
with physicians, respiratory therapists, nurses, and so on, along with our colleagues in the durable medical equipment company uh, world in the hospital, but also in the home. There are a lot of things happening. Caregivers, patients are getting involved. And then in the outpatient arena, you've got another set of clinicians. So what is the patient to do when the information that is necessary for their care is spread across these 10 different groups who themselves are not necessarily communicating in such a way that these handoffs are occurring in any structured, systematic, thoughtful way. Um, I think many of you will recognize the electronic health record has not solved this problem. If anything, has made it more challenging because these EHRs are not transferable. The information sends siloed and in, in places, and many of us who use electronic health records, we may be documenting information, but it's staying in our little silo. And the question is, who's reading this stuff, right? This is a relay race. Who's, who are we handing off the baton to, and who's getting it, who's understanding this? I can tell you most patients are saying, we're not doing this right. So this is a challenge for us as an organization and as clinicians is how are we contributing to the solution here and how are we contributing to the problem? And we may need to start thinking about how to communicate among ourselves. So I'm going to now take you through a series of observations. Uh, I think the theme will, will become very evident here. I've already kind of spilled the beans. I've told you the, the run up here, which is we have a communication problem here. And that has led to care gaps and those care gaps are hurting people. And I think a lot of it has been um, accelerated because of the, the problems with the reimbursements. But I think we should not only look at that. We may need to look inver inwardly as clinicians. How are we dealing with this? So this is uh, from the literature regarding what happens when patients are hospitalized. This is a study that Dr. Uh, Ayu Tan, uh, um, Tom Kalstrom, and I did along with a number of others where I think some of you may actually have filled out these forms. We sent out a membership survey saying, would you tell us a little bit about what you know about oxygen services, and I suspect some of you in this audience actually contributed data to this. So here are the results. So about 490 respiratory therapists, uh, you all had to be members of AARC, all had to be respiratory therapists who provide in-hospital care for individuals with COPD. Those were the sort of the rules about who was allowed to uh, complete the survey. About uh, 490 individuals or 490 respiratory therapists filled out the survey, and about half of you said, I'm not all that familiar with criteria for home oxygen. Now, I don't think that's a respiratory therapist issue. I think same thing with clini other clinicians, nurses, doctors, all of us. We tend to work in our silos, and those of us that are more hospital-based, we may not be understanding what we need to know in order to make more effective transitions in care. We then did some qualitative work where uh, Ms. Scully and some others actually interviewed physicians, respiratory therapists, and so on. And this is a direct quote uh, uh, from a respiratory therapist saying, physicians need better access in the electronic health records to figure out when to initiate an evaluation for home oxygen. Right now, there are no clinical decision support tools saying, hey, this person might need a little closer look. They might need oxygen. And by the way, if they're on oxygen, they may need to be reevaluated about whether or not their oxygen prescription needs to be revised. You know, this idea that it's oxygen or not is probably not it. We need to figure out what's the right equipment, what's the right dose, how do we educate people on how to use this equipment and dose. We also did another uh, study uh, uh, with Dr. Zadie and I at two different hospitals in Chicago where we did chart reviews in about 340 or 335 hospitalizations for CV. We actually read the charts individually, and we found that only about a quarter of individuals with COPD hospitalized for an exacerbation had an adequate evaluation before going home. So a lot of people are just coming through the doors and everyone's focused on the antibiotics and, and perhaps, you know, uh, their, their systemic steroids and maybe their diuresis, um, and no one's sort of peeking under the hood saying, what about this oxygen thing? Do we need to figure out, is this person going home on the right prescription? The same study that Dr. Zaidi and I uh, uh, published so that it's even worse with respect to documentation. So even when we do actually get it right and do some evaluation, we're not doing a very good job with respect to actually documenting the information in such a way that the information now is communicated across those 10 stakeholder groups, as I mentioned. Number four, what are we doing with patient education? It gets worse, right? 
So uh, uh, the study that Susan Jacobs did, I think some of you know, was published in the Annals of the American Thoracic Society. Several of you, I think, are co-authors of that. She's a, a nurse at Stanford who, who basically feels like she's had enough. We need, to, we need to do better here. And so she uh, did a survey around 2,000 patients. It's the largest study that I'm aware of, asking patients directly, what do you think about the care you're getting? And what are your thoughts about how to move forward? So only 8% of patients who responded said they got any education about how to use their equipment from a clinician. So from someone who understands the physiology, understands the evidence, and can provide thoughtful advice. Probably not something we should be proud of. We need to figure this out. Um, I won't read all the quotes here, but this goes on and on. You can talk to trainees, you can talk to durable medical equipment companies, physicians, nurses, and so on, and everyone's assuming someone else is doing the work. So what about at home? What's happening at home? So Susan's study of around 2,000 patients found that about half the patients said they're having a problem with their oxygen equipment, and most of them said I'm having more than one problem. Um, so here's a quote uh, from the field. Uh, this is a particular patient that was interviewed saying that people delivering the equipment are drivers. They say, I think you're supposed to put this part over there, and then they left. This person had no medical or clinical training. Again, what's happening now is that this has become commoditized where, we're, where the payment policies are creating bizarre incentives to do the very least. And so what's happening is life-saving equipment are being handed off to patients with very little support to figure out how to use the equipment. Would we ever do that in the hospital with a ventilator? You know, roll a ventilator in, don't even plug it in, and say, press that button, turn it on. I'll come back tomorrow, right? Life-saving equipment, oxygen, life-saving equipment. H how do we as professionals allow this to get this far? Patient evaluation, so what we mentioned along the journey, it's not only getting the patient on the right equipment, the question is, what are we doing um, when the patient comes back to us? Uh, we're a study about uh, almost 20 years ago, so there's very little literature in this field, not enough studies, and so what happens is the policymakers are not having enough evidence, so now they're working off of cost reductions as opposed to what's the right thing to do based on evidence, right? So a study from 18 years ago demonstrated that only about a third of patients who returned uh, to clinics after a COPD hospitalization uh, were actually evaluated appropriately for whether or not they were on the right equipment, right dose, and so on. And there's a couple of quotes here uh, saying that oftentimes patients don't come back to follow-up visits. You know, we know that exists. Uh, have you ever walked around with an oxygen tank? How easy is it to actually get to places? And by the way, as many of you know, that piece of oxygen equipment, oftentimes a tank, only lasts for a couple of hours. So how does a patient get from home into some kind of transportation to the hospital, check in, and then by the time they get seen by a clinician, that tank is probably empty, if not empty on route. So, right? so the issue is what about concentrators, portable concentrators, all kinds of equipment. These are hard pieces of equipment that is just not accessible to most of our patients. I probably wouldn't go see my doctor unless I really needed to if I had a piece of oxygen equipment that I wasn't sure I was going to have enough to make it back home safely. So we need to think about when 20, 30% of people are not showing up, rather than saying, well, we need to figure out how to make them show up, we need to figure out, well, why are they not showing up? How can we do better? And as a profession, we need to understand what are some different models of care. Should we go to people's homes? Which, by the way, is what exactly the NOT study, the MRC study did. They did home visits in order to help support patients in their homes, as opposed to requiring them to come to clinics to figure out if they're getting the right oxygen. Okay? Okay, documentation, uh, really not any better in the outpatient arena. Uh, I think this is a particular quote from an advanced practice saying, a nurse saying that I don't really know what happened in the hospital, no information comes through. I don't think they're doing a walk test. I don't know what auction company were set up. I don't know the prescription numbers. Uh, there's insufficient discharge notices. There's never anything in the discharge summary. There's no communication with the outpatient side. Obviously a frustrated clinician saying, I just don't have any information to figure out what I'm supposed to be doing. So even if they were testing the patient in the clinic, we don't really know how much of it is different than what happened when they went home. How do you have a communication with a patient if you don't know where they began? 
Patient education, uh, same information. They're saying, this is challenging for us. We have 20 minutes in the outpatient clinic. Uh, I, I don't have enough time to do the detective work, get on the phone to figure out what I need to do. Um, and so there's frustration all the way through. So what can be done, what should be done, what must be done, right? So I've sort of given you the problem statement, which is life-saving therapy, no doubt about it. We've had a disruption in how that therapy is now being distributed. There's a number of policy issues around it. We as clinicians and as patients have not been working together to figure out how do we make sure the policies are correct and how do we stand together as one. It has now started with the USCOPD coalition and I encourage all of you to get involved. How do we make progress here? So I'm gonna start off by saying, uh, before we point fingers at other groups to do something else, let's also look at our own practices. What are we doing? How are we contributing to this problem? What can we do better? I realize that it's a tall order when, when you don't have enough time or not enough reimbursement, but I think we should at least begin with, can we be part of the solution? Uh, some of you will, will recognize the ask, advise, assist sort of approach. This is how smoking cessation interventions are, are, are discussed. This is the same process here. So number one, we need to ask our patients in a more consistent manner, do they know, or do they understand it about their oxygen equipment, any questions they may have about using it safely, do you know when to use it, uh, uh, what are the things getting in the way of being able to use your equipment. We may need to begin that dialogue here so we understand that this poor patient recognizes that you care about that piece of equipment. Or if you see a patient come into your clinic, if you're in the outpatient arena, who is being prescribed, who is on long-term oxygen therapy but shows up without oxygen, there's a problem there. And I've seen that many, many times, but I'm not sure I've paid as much attention to it as I need to. So the question is, what do we need to do about this? So advise. A common thing that we've seen across all of our interviews is that people tend to use the, their actual equipment when they feel short of breath as opposed to using it continuously if that's what was prescribed based on, on, their, um, uh, on their evaluation. So this notion that you know when to use it, we all know is false. In fact, the pulse oximeter is one of the greatest changes and the greatest advances in respiratory care because we moved away from asking somebody, are you short of breath, and therefore I should give you oxygen, to actually measuring their oxygen level. Obviously, we now do arterial blood gases, and we have a number of other things as well, but we cannot rely on just knowing that you're short of breath. I think we all know that that's not a particularly healthy way of doing things. We obviously should advise people about smoking and, and the risks of smoking while on oxygen, but I'm not sure our only advice is to scare people from their equipment. That's basically what's happening right now, is we're scaring people about their equipment and about explosions. Assisting. Again, I understand this is a tall order, but something we need to be thinking about systematically within our various organizations, both professional organizations and healthcare organizations, is let's figure out if the patient's on the right equipment today. No matter what, uh, even if things were appropriate three months ago or a month ago or a year ago, their needs may be very different today. And so the question is, they may be more mobile, less mobile. There may be changes in their equipment. I think many of you also know that there's a misconception here that a piece of equipment, that particularly these concentrators, these portable concentrators, these little knobs, those knobs, those numbers on those knobs don't really relate to the number of liters per minute of oxygen. And this is a common misconception that you can go from an oxygen tank of three liters per minute to a, a knob being twirled on a, on a portable oxygen concentrator of three, that those are the same thing. They have nothing to do with each other. And so we need to test people on the equipment that they're actually using. These are things that as a profession, we need to figure out how to clean up our own practices. Uh, and I'm not only speaking to a respiratory therapist, I'm speaking to my physician colleagues in the audience as well. This is a common problem we all have. And then I think we need to find how to connect our patients to other patient communities so they can start to support each other. There's not enough respiratory therapists, there's not enough doctors or nurses to be able to provide ongoing one-on-one -on -one mentoring. We certainly will need to do our part. But there are a number of patient advocacy groups now, peer coaching, uh, there's the COPD Foundation that's helping patients with COPD. There are a number of groups here that are starting to get into the fold of providing peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. And we need to find ways to connect patients to other patients that to give them some ongoing support. 
Because believe me, what they need is not just medical information about their equipment. They need social and emotional supports of how to actually deal with the fact that now I'm, I'm tied to this tank. How do I get on with the rest of my life? And those are things that I think patients uh, pr can provide better supports than we can. So that's all the bad news. Um, uh, I'm not entirely sure why I put this uh, Gary Larson uh, uh, you know, cartoon in here, but I figured we needed a break. Um, I was actually looking for a Gary Larson a cartoon with an oxygen tank, but I think uh, he, he, he didn't know about this problem when he stopped making cartoons. Um, so the question is, I think it's not going to be enough for people like me to stand up and say we need to do more. Uh, I think we recognize that um, uh, we are in a very constrained environment. You can only ask so much of clinicians. At some point, you've got to recognize we need to support clinicians and provide them the time and the reimbursement and supports to make it happen. Uh, otherwise, you'll get burnout. Uh, and maybe that's why I thought about this cartoon, a little burnout, uh, and, and go to extinction. So hopefully, we don't become extinct. Now, I, I do think that uh, our path forward uh, uh, is not only about ask, uh, uh, advise, and assist, but I think it's advocate. We, we've got to recognize that as clinicians that we need to be at the table. And I think there's a quote that if you're not at the table, you're on the table, right? And I think we have become on the table here because we've not been at the table um, a driving policy. So I think join whichever organization you're most comfortable with. Obviously, the AARC is one that's a natural. They're a leader in this space. Um, I've worked with Tom and a number of others at AARC um, uh, on, on various things. But I think we need to um, uh, join, join hands here and to say, OK, we have a problem. We will work with payers and policymakers to provide them the evidence that they need to move policy. But, but I think uh, communication that we just, this is a problem, fix it is not enough. We're going to need to be part of the solution. So how do we create demonstration projects? How do we move to evidence-based policies as opposed to the evidence-free zone in which policies are currently operating? And the evidence are not going to be done by policymakers alone. It's going to need people like us engaged in some organized way. Um, so one of the things that some of you may know that we have started to engage an entire other discipline uh, into, in order to improve healthcare. Um, you know, I've been in practice of medicine for uh, 25, almost 30 years now, and I think some of the things that are broke, I'm not sure I can even figure out where to start. I'm just, I'm too entrenched in my own way of thinking, and moreover, the interactions I have are from my perspective. It's hard to, hard to be open-minded and hard to see the other perspective. Some of you, uh, I think, do that better than others, but we may need to bring in uh, others who think about the human experience or the human factors component of what we provide as healthcare practitioners. Um, while we do provide technical information that requires a lot of training and sophistication and so on, at the end of the day, we're a service industry. We're providing services. And we may need to think a little bit about how other industries who provide services have been thinking about providing products and services that meet the needs of the end users, in our case, patients and their caregivers. So I'm not sure this is the only solution, but at the University of Illinois, we're starting to look outside of the healthcare sector to help us figure out how we can think a little bit more thoughtfully about the experience of care, not only from the patient's perspective, which obviously is important, but from the clinician's perspective. So we're not asking them to do more and more and more, but the question is how do we make doing the right thing the easy thing to do, right? So that's the concept here. So this is a field called human-centered design. Um, um, it is probably one of many types of ways of moving forward. You are going to be hearing more and more about this. It turns out there's about 10 very prominent health systems around the country, Mayo Clinic, Memorial Sloan Kettering, UCSF, uh, and others who are baking into their healthcare operations experts in human-centered design to think about what happens as patients navigate through the health system both in the hospital and outside in their homes, how do we connect those dots, right? Who is interacting with these individuals? Are we supporting individuals in the right way so we're not relying on people to figure out what to do, but what are the system solutions in place? Um, so again, this is meant to be a mini primer. Uh, uh, there will be more and more on this. Uh, I, I guarantee you, you're gonna be hearing more about human-centered design uh, over the next decade or two. But the, the entire concept of how designers work is that they put people at the center of the paradigm. So in this case, as you might see, 
uh, the, the poor individual there, it looks like maybe a child or a caregiver um, sitting at the middle, and the question is, who are they connecting to throughout their healthcare journey? Is it physicians? Is it nurses? Is it teachers? You know, some of the healthcare that occurs actually occurs in schools, particularly if you're providing uh, healthcare to, to children. Is it your workplace? You know, what are, what are the system solutions in place in order to promote best practices? And this is called a stakeholder mapping activity. Uh, it, it, many of us do this instinctively, you know, before you start a policy, we try to figure out who are the people that we need to invite to the table. Uh, there is a systematic, uh, methodological, rigorous way of thinking about this. Number two, uh, this idea of having a holistic and systematic examination of context. That's a mouthful, but basically what it means is moving away from surveys and focus groups and actually embedding yourself where the work is happening to understand the context in which the decisions are being made. It's a little hard to sit in a conference room and imagine what's happening in the emergency department. Right? Those are completely different places. Pretty hard to be sitting in a boardroom and making policies for how people, frontline clinicians, are working. Now, you may be really a clairvoyant individual and you know what's happening, but most of us don't have those skills. So the question is, how do we start to understand in, from the field what is happening, why people are behaving in certain ways? In most cases, we're, we're rational actors. We're behaving in a certain way because the systems are set up in such a way that that's the path of least resistance. It's possible that we take the path of high resistance periodically to do the right thing or the harder thing, but we can't sustain that forever. So the question is, what's happening there? So these are what's called contextual inquiry. There's a number of sophisticated uh, published frameworks that, that measure experience, uh, and that may be an overused term in some case, but basically it's the experience of providing care, it's the experience of receiving care, it's the experience of transmitting information, it's the experiences that we all face as we interact with our patients and among ourselves. The experience of entering information in the electronic health record, I'm sure that's a good experience worth knowing about. Um, there's also a lot of iterative uh, prototyping and assessment, so it's a very active field where solution sets are brought to the table early so they can be iteratively tested and improved. You don't wait for a year or two years to have a solution brought to you. You're part of the process in building the solution sets, be it a communication tool for discharge or perhaps how uh, RTs and MDs and RNs are communicating with themselves. What is, the, what is the structure by which we have structured communication? How do we facilitate that? How do we work with hospital IS to make changes to the electronic health record so that the information we're putting is not just a documentation exercise, it's a communication activity. Uh, there's a lot of stakeholder engagement from the beginning, as, as you could imagine. Um, so by the end of the day, when solution sets are proposed, nobody is surprised or shocked. You are actually part of the process from the beginning. Your input was incorporated, and in fact, the solution is stakeholder optimized, meaning that your ideas and all the exceptions and all the issues that we know exist are baked in so that your exceptions could also be handled with whatever solution it's set is being developed. And then finally, there's some really nice way of uh, using visual communication, uh, ways that I was never trained in. I sort of know when I pick up something that this looks like it's gonna work and kind of a messy form that we know is just a mess, but I'm not one that knows how to make documents and communication supports in a way that that actually uh, does it on their own. That's not my skill set. And, and I think designers, many of them are information designers that know how to transmit information in a thoughtful way. So this is just a little mini example. Uh, there's lots of other things that we're doing. In fact, there's a consortium of health, human-centered design working with healthcare organizations, starting to put their arms around how are we gonna do this together. Uh, uh, to solve healthcare's uh, challenging problems. So on the left-hand side of, your, of the screen is our current discharge tool that we have in our clinic. That these are, this is a document I felt very proud of. You know, all the words are good, and this is what I used to hand out for years. And when the design team got together, they said, you know, to Dr. Krishnan, um, I'm not sure anybody's actually reading this stuff because it's written for you. It's not written for the end user. And so uh, lots of uh, uh, empty space, a lot of color, a lot of coding. And what you can see on here is that, uh, again, there's a lot of detail that I'm not gonna go through today, but this discharge tool from clinic, so this is a clinic to home, what's called the patient transition tool. It has information about who they're gonna see, when they're gonna see. It also has information about their medications with pictures. 
so that these are actually stickers that my nurse peels off and then actually sticks it onto the form so the patient knows exactly what they're going on because this is what it looks like. There's also a, a, a panel in there about oxygen that you'll see on, on the left-hand side at, uh, at 7 o'clock that says what are the oxygen, what equipment are you supposed to be using at different times of activity. So much more graphic, uh, user interface driven, and fewer words. I think the message here is communication only works at, if people get it at a glance. If you're going to force people to read paragraph after paragraph, you're just not going to get there because people are busy, people have different levels of health literacy, and, uh, and it's just not going to work. Thank you.